Hello and welcome to my sixth CPD Coffee Time with me, Dr Tina Ray. Today I'm going to focus on understanding and supporting children and young people with body image problems and eating disorders. So presenting some basic information, but also some key tools, some ideas and strategies as to how we can support young people with these difficulties in the school context. So I'm currently working as a psychologist, a consultant psychologist for a fostering agency, and also continuing to write relatively prolifically. Um, and I'm really, really proud of my association, particularly with Nurture UK. So you'll find many of my publications with them. And um, I am really, really passionate about providing user-friendly evidence-based resources for practitioners in schools, on the ground in schools, to use, make use of with children and young people to promote and maintain mental health and well-being. I've now also had a long association with Hinton House Publishers, so I will be making reference to the ASD Girls Wellbeing Toolkit and their Wellbeing Toolkit for Mental Health Leads in this session, as there are specific um, strategies and resources in both of those publications around both issues I'm going to be pre presenting today. So some of the key aims here, I'm, I'm on just to begin to understand where some of this pressure to look a certain way comes from and consider our own views around what we, we perceive to be the ideal body image for young people and adults, and with particular reference to social media and the impact that that clearly has upon them, and all of us in essence, in the way that we see our bodies. And think about how this impacts on our emotional well-being, and become aware of the fact that obesity and eating disorders are on the increase, and also that they begin much, much earlier than many of us had previously thought. I want us to particularly focus on body dysmorphia, as this is something that um, I'm becoming increasingly aware of, and also clarify the link between the ASD girls and eating disorders, which is also an area I have particular interest in. So in essence, thinking about how we can best um, identify these problems in the school, but also begin to promote the levels of resilience and ensure effective communication. So teaching media awareness in particular will be a key focus. So what is body image? Ruth McConville, Dr. Ruth McConville, my dear friend, um, published a book for Jessica Kingsley, 2019, um, which is well worth looking at. It, it's real, real focus is on early years. So this is where we've had lots of conversations around how body image begins um, in terms of pro problematic body image very much earlier on than we'd recently thought. Um, she says that everyone has a body image, clearly. It's what each individual thinks and feels about his or her appearance. And that person's body image has very little to do with what they actually look like. Um, and anyone, whatever they look like, whether they are um, perceived to be someone who looks brilliant in terms of what we perceive as the norm of beauty in our culture, can have a positive or a negative body image. So if you're doing this CPD session on your own or with a group of friends or colleagues, um, the, the activity that I'd ask you to do is just to think about what you see when you look in the mirror and don't reflect too deeply. Just, you know, come up with the, the first initial thoughts, feelings, words, the, the descriptors that come into your own mind. Um, the idea here is just to reinforce the fact that for many of us, these will not be particularly positive, however much other people perceive us as looking good. So. I think it's really important to reflect on our narratives around our own body image. So in essence, body image is how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, when you picture yourself in your own mind, and it's what you believe about your own appearance. And this includes memories that you may have and assumptions and generalisations you may have made in the, in the past, particularly in relation to things that people have told you, such as parents or carers or peer groups. Um, it's how you feel about your body, including your height, shape and weight, and how you sense and control your body as it moves so how you feel in your body it's not just about your body the girl guides um, attitude survey in 2016 highlighted how um, the problems around body image were beginning much younger and the sexualization of children was particularly pertinent and important to note here the fact that girls as young as seven feeling the impact of sexist images in the media and 47% of girls aged 11 to 21 feeling that the way they look holds them back. And equally, boys, this is becoming increasingly an issue for them. 
and I would say again directly linked to social media. 23% of boys now believe a perfect male body exists and 55% of boys aged 11 to 18 would change their diet and do change their diets to improve their appearance. So body dissatisfaction essentially happens when a person has negative thoughts or feelings about their appearance and this is on a continuum. It can be vary from something being really quite mild for um, different body characteristics to something really serious and distressing associated with the appearance. So it can include dislike uh, on a scale, on a continuum from minor dislike to major significant dislike for one's shape, skin, size, colour, facial characteristics, etc. So this is essentially body dissatisfaction. And these individuals will regularly worry about how they look and they'll be really anxious about their weight and fear becoming fat or overweight in, may, in the main and have a negative view of their appearance and be preoccupied with certain parts that they'd like to change, such as their nose, their lips, their, their eyebrows, etc. And also comparing themselves all the time to other people and wish that they looked like them. And body dysmorphic disorder is essentially the extreme end of this continuum of not liking the way that we look. Um, and Phillips called it the disorder of imagined ugliness. And it's, it's basically a serious mental illness related to OCD, obsessional compulsive disorder. And the focus here is on a perceived deficit or defect in the person's appearance. And this is important because what that individual sees in the mirror is, is not what we see at all. But this leads to these really obsessive, repetitive behaviours. It's not the same as being self-obsessed because it causes that person to feel really ashamed of their appearance. And it's the shame that is the key element here and the, the distinct difference. So it leads to low self-esteem and shame and that is directly related to this dislike of certain um, elements of the appearance. And these excessive worries that um, those with body dysmorphic disorder experience can be really, really overwhelming. So they, they can occur from approximately three to eight hours every single day. So the treatment for this usually involves elements of CPD or medication, and both of these can reduce symptoms of body dysmorphic disorder. And unfortunately, obviously, cosmetic surgery is rarely successful because, of course, it doesn't stop the, the kind of pattern, the cycle of obsessive compulsive thinking and behaviours. So when we're, we're worried about a child or, or young person, we, we, we need to know the signs and symptoms to look out for. And usually there are obviously clearly a wide variation here, but usually they will have a focus on one specific body part. Um, and these can include a minor scar, acne, facial, head or body hair, etc. Um, and increasingly, uh, my GP friend is seeing children, young people absolutely obsessed with the size and shape of genitalia or breasts and muscle size in particular. So particularly for boys with this notion of bigorexia, wanting to um, pump up their bodies to make them look um, larger than they really naturally should be. So common signs of this kind of bigorexia notion, which I think the, 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 this term was first coined by Tanya Byron, um, surround going really the extra mile, I suppose, to, to becoming obsessed about this preoccupation with muscle building, overtraining, overuse of protein supplements and at times steroid abuse. And of course, anabolic steroids are um, something that we're increasingly worried about. Um, the side effects are pretty dramatic and pretty dangerous um, in terms of um, hair loss, thyroid problems, potential stroke, heart attack, um, imp impotency, etc. So there, there are some significant problems to highlight here. So like many other mental health disorders, BDD is likely to be due to a combination of neurological, biological, environmental and genetic factors. Um, and basically the risk is heightened and as with many mental illnesses if you have close biological relatives who also have this disorder or you've experienced negative childhood situations like bullying or teasing and also certain personality traits um, like low self-esteem and this this feeling um, of the societal pressure to meet certain standards of um, beauty um, the norm for being good looking etc so um, the complex is complex I think and, and and we mustn't underestimate the complexity of the causes of BDD so key things to look out for um, if we're avoiding mirrors not allowing the picture to be taken repeatedly combing hair shaving or engaging in other grooming activities that are totally obsessional all the time uh, repeatedly touching checking or measuring the perceived floor 
wearing excessive makeup, this is very common, or, or growing a beard to, to cover up the floor, um, wearing certain types of clothing like hat scarves to cover up the floor, over exercising, constantly changing clothes, making multiple doctor visits, particularly to dermatologists. And for those who have access to um, plastic surgery, there will be an obsession with this um, in, in order to try and eradicate or minimise the, the perceived flaw. So I have worked with young women who've repeatedly had Botox injections pumped up their lips. They've um, tattooed eyebrows, which I, I know is, is relatively common now. Um, but also what they're doing now is um, saving up for breast implants at a much earlier age than they would have done previously. And also having plastic surgery to uh, floors which really no one else would actually notice. So I think this is really important to factor in um, because at the extreme end of the continuum, this obsession can lead to a range of multiple medical procedures that really should not have been undertaken. Um, complete, completely um, all the time seeking reassurance by asking people how they look, what, the, what their opinion is. So many of my young girls who are obsessed with their appearance in this way and have a, a real obsession about a particular body part will be online constantly posting pictures actually and asking for affirmations from others. Compulsive skin picking, avoiding social situations, trying to keep these obsessions and compulsions secret because they are worried about any kind of social stigma, which is relatively common with any mental health disorder. Uh, clearly suffering from emotional problems, feelings of disgust, depression, low self-esteem and anxiety. And also this genuine belief that they adhere to, however incorrect it is, that others will take special notice of the perceived flaw. So whenever they're going out or engaging in a new social context, they think that everyone is looking at the thing that they perceive to be wrong with them. But there is hope because with the right intervention, clearly over time, many young people can actually recover from this kind of disorder. And usually it's a combination of a particular form of CBT, exposure and response prevention. Um, and I think this is around taking steps to confront these situations that cause these irrational concerns, such as going out in public. Um, so. I, th I think it's, it's also when you think about gradual desensitisation, gradually being able to take the layers of makeup off and to go outside and take shorter walks, which increase over time and, and engage in social interactions. But again, um, reducing the amount of time that they would seek reassurance also alongside this. But it has to be clearly delivered by um, the appropriate therapist. So I think for many of our children, young people, access to this kind of treatment obviously has to be ensured through the usual medical routes. So I think, you know, what, what we need to understand here is that this is the top end of the continuum, but we also need to be vigilant when we're working with young people in schools, because some of them will be at this top end. And so the, the, the OCD cycle, basically, for many of these young people with, with this kind of disorder is around being so obsessive, which increases levels of anxiety. To get relief from that, that anxiety, they will engage in the compulsions. And whether or not that's a, a form of self-harm is, is debatable, but that, that those compulsions might be around the, the layers of makeup, the wearing the hoodie, the not going out, etc. They will get a sense of relief from that, but then that it still doesn't take away the obsessions. So when working with children and young people, body image um, difficulties, obviously the CBT approach, which I did outline in my first session of these CPD coffee times, is usually um, an essential part of the therapeutic package. So identifying the activating event, what the beliefs are, and then challenging that belief, because our beliefs are not necessarily facts. And clearly in the case of body image um, and, and BDD in particular, what we think is, is generally not a fact. It's usually irrational and it's not based in reality. And then thinking about the consequences, the feelings and behaviour relating to these beliefs and, and what these beliefs generate. So in essence, what we want is to support children to learn how to interrupt this vicious cycle. So seeing the connection between their thoughts, feelings and behaviours, seeing how they work for them or whether they don't. And in essence, they will not be working. And I think this is really, really important because our beliefs, as Seligman said, spell the difference between dejection, giving up engaging in learned helplessness or a sense of well-being and constructive action. And what we want is for children to be able to really 
understand how to challenge their negative automatic thinking, how to actually understand the irrationality of their beliefs and begin to challenge them and to begin to replace them with something that is more effective. But again, this takes time. So in essence, body image is learned and formed from many sources. So within child, within young person factors, our own personality, our nature, so to speak, the family environment, things that people have said to us in the family and whether or not there are body image or BDD elements within parents, carers who are supporting and nurturing our children, our peer group, cultural factors, what the beauty norms are, appear to be, and also clearly social media. So it's vital, I think, in essence, to, to start with where we can really make a difference in schools, which is around actually teaching media literacy and getting children and young people to understand when images are airbrushed and, and how sexualised some of the um, images are that are presented to them and the impact that this has on their body image and their well-being overall. We need them to understand that all media images are messages and constructions. They're not actually reflections of reality. So they've been carefully put together with an intent to send a very specific message. And it's usually to sell something, basically, to convince you to buy or support a particular product. So they will often construct an emotional experience that looks like reality. And we're really only seeing what the advertisers want us to see. And it's really important as early as possible that children, and young people can see and understand this. And this is because the social psychological price of social media is really significant for our young people. This kind of greater internalisation of the thin, beautiful ideal, more self-objectification, more frequent social comparisons, which leads to general um, decrease in levels of happiness on a daily basis, and also increased level of disordered eating, a greater investment in appearance as opposed to character and my achievements, and also obviously increased levels of depression, anxiety and low self-esteem. And what I think is really, really important to factor in here is that the problem does start very, very early. And this is why I'm saying we need to actually get in there earlier. So when children and young people are coming into nursery, we need to be challenging um, this whole narrative and particularly um, what is presented to them on social media. Children as young as three are worrying about being fat and four to five year olds know that skinny is good and fat is bad even before they start school. So these messages are being subsumed very, very early on. And we know there is a strong correlation between low self-esteem and being overweight in young children. And there's more bullying directed at overweight children compared to their non-overweight peers. And unfortunately, the cycle um, starts very, very early on. This whole kind of compulsion that children have to be online with their tablets, with their iPhones, um, watching um, or playing games um, online, etc., um, combined with this kind of um, more access to a diet that is probably less healthy leads to a mildly obese child. But of course, then what that then leads to is an inactive child who becomes moderately obese, who then becomes severely obese because actually engaging in physical activity becomes quite uncomfortable. So there is this vicious cycle that we need to actually um, intervene at the much, much earlier stage. So the, the need for physical activity, the need for a real disciplined approach to how much time our children and young people spend online sitting still, um, focused on looking at images which um, would saturate them with these ideas of a body ideal, um, is really, really important that we actually ensure that we get in there much, much earlier. So I'm talking about three years of age. So next couple of slides are going to be thinking about how we promote a positive body image. And I think that preventing body dissatisfaction in, in kids is often less a case of actively doing and saying positive things and more a case of saying fewer negative things. To be honest, this idea of celebrating our bodies, looking at how beautiful we are, is, is actually an adult one. Children's bodies should not be objectified. They should be thought about less, talked about less, and actually just simply taken for granted. We need to adhere to key three principles when we're working with children. So showing them, talking to them about the fact that human beings come in many shapes and sizes. Diversity should be respected and valued and we respect the bodies of others even when they're quite different to us. Everyone's body is a good body. Okay, everyone's body is a good body and that's the message that we need to give out. And we need to teach body appreciation as opposed to loving the way that I look. So thinking about what they can do, do with their bodies, 
the wonderful things they can do, the walking, the jumping, the playing football, using your body to sing, to create things, appreciate all the tasks that we can accomplish with our bodies. Responding with gratitude, very, very useful and helpful in terms of increasing happiness and self-esteem all, all round. And seeing this, that the body is something to take care of, not to punish with diets, exercise um, or punishing comparisons or cruel words. And this is important. This does not equate to not exercising, not making sure we have a healthy diet and not making sure that we are honest about the fact that sometimes we um, possibly are not as healthy as we should be and don't take as good care of our bodies as we should. That's fine. But that is very, very different to punishing ourselves with these things. And I think, you know, children, young people, let's talk about what's a really healthy diet, how we can make our bodies feel better so they can do more good things um, and be more useful to us. And that's much, much healthier. And also, let's increase children's resilience, this third factor here, to pressures on their body image. So encouraging them to be more accepting of their own and less critical about other people's shapes and sizes. If you've been brought up with parents who continually make assessments of the way other people look, and um, many of us may possibly have had mothers who did just this when we were children, talking about their friends who may have put on a few pounds and she doesn't look quite so good, etc, etc. And this is clearly, again, a narrative that young children absorb. So we need to be very careful careful of our narratives when we're around our kids that we're not actually feeding into this by giving these negative assessments of how other people look. Also challenge the visual conformity of the media by, by, by making the children able to see that there are many forms of beauty. And also when we talk about people in general, let's put more emphasis on their personal attributes, their character, their achievements, what their talents and abilities, their outlook, what lovely people they are, how kind they are, how good they are, what they do for other people, etc., as opposed to what they look like. Let's change the narrative here. So essentially, effective communication between adults and children is absolutely essential. And this is what works in favour of body satisfaction. So giving them our attention to talk about things, to get things off their chest, to talk through any negative feelings about their body image or thinking about food and dieting. This is really, really important. This communication, this connection is what ensures our children's well-being in all areas, actually, including body image and body dissatisfaction. And as I said earlier, let's reduce this screen time. This is absolutely essential. We need to timetable this in and be very, I would say, strict about this. It might sound old fashioned, but I think this is absolutely essential. We can timetable it in, but we need to be very, very clear that a lot of this is not healthy. And, and you know, having five to six hours a day online is not good for body image. So we know this. We, we know it. It's common sense. So let's let's sort it out. Let's act as the parents in our relationships with children and not the reverse. And also factor this thinking in too. Beauty is not a magical route to happiness. OK, I know many people who are extremely beautiful or they appear to be or they present as in terms of what is regarded as the beauty norm, but they are not particularly happy. And I think this is really, really important. The study Very Happy People found that the happiest individuals were no more attractive than those who scored in the average range. How interesting is this? Happy people think they're more physically attractive than unhappy people. Isn't that interesting? Even if they're not by the perceived body um, norms, the, the norms of beauty in terms of body image. Um, there are much stronger predictions of happiness than beauty. And we know what these are. Relationships clearly matter more. Our happiness levels, happiness levels and contentment generally come from good, positive, nurturing, reciprocal relationships. And also, I think this is essential, a sense of meaning and challenging, interesting work and interests clearly matter more. This is what overall gives us our level of life satisfaction. So moving on to this, this area of eating disorders, um, which clearly is something that we, we are seeing a, an increase, um, sadly, due, due to the fact, I think, that there are much more kind of, um, there's much more of a, an image problem with our young people in terms of their access to social media and also within the peer group um, and the, the kind of pressures that they experience mm -hmm. online are really significant. Um, so I think that this is something that we all need to 
gen up on really, understand a wee bit more so that we're, we're really, really um, not just ensuring that the media literacy is, is on target in schools, but also that all of us can actually talk about these issues to children and young people in a reasonably confident way, but also that we're alert and that we're looking out for specific difficulties and problems that children might be experiencing. We know that these problems can affect anyone at any age. Um, unfortunately, women aged 20 to 12 to 20 are most likely to be affected. And we know also that diagnosis, a specific diagnosis, is usually essential to access appropriate um, clinical treatment. Um, so uh, I think let, let's just have a look at what these eating disorders are and then think about what we can do at school based level to support children and young people. Remaining hopeful here is key, I must say. Um, so just to factor this into our thinking as we go through the next few slides, we know that people do and can recover with the right intervention. Um, fortunately, without the, the proper treatment, obviously serious mental health and physical health problems occur. So very, very important though to factor in this notion of hope. So these particular difficulties are probably the most common that we might see, so anorexia. This is where children and young people keep a low body weight by dieting, vomiting, using laxatives, excessive exercise, etc. Bulimia, uh, a game where um, individuals feel they've lost control over their eating, so they eat large amounts of food, so they'll binge and then vomit, take laxatives or diuretics to stop weight gain. Binge eating disorder, so they'll binge on a regular basis, um, but it's usually planned in advance and, th and they will feel very guilty and, and a level of disgust and shame afterwards. Emotional overeating, um, uh, uh, and this is really quite common in, in, in many of us um, children and adults yeah, alike. Yeah. So actually consuming great amounts of food in response to negative emotions rather than actually feeling hungry and disordered eating or eating problems. So sometimes this is pick up eating inedible items, um, regurgitating food, nighttime eating syndrome as well, Prada Willy. So it's never actually feeling full. So are they another form of self-harm? Um, I think for many of us, this um, notion that, you know, eating disorders often, you know, people with them often use food and, and the control of it to try and compensate for feelings and emotion that might otherwise seem overwhelming is similar, I think, to um, elements of self-harm where people engage in self-harm behaviours to actually get a sense of relief from these emotions which are overwhelming, which really, really are calling, causing psychological distress. So at this point in the presentation, just, you know, take your pen and pencil out or pen um, and think about, you know, what you, you would perceive the factors to be around disordered eating, because it's not simply about food and diets. Think about the other factors that might play a role in the development or continuation of disordered eating behaviours. Um, if you're doing this on your own, obviously that's fine. If, you, if you're using this session as part of a group CPD, then maybe you could just stop and pause the presentation for now and, and just have a, a wee brainstorm around what you think these factors might be that play a role in the development or continuation of eating disorders. So basically, we know that there are psychological factors, low self-esteem, feelings, feelings of inadequacy or lack of control or autonomy, and obviously depression, anxiety, anger or loneliness are the psychological factors that would underpin eating disorders. Interpersonal factors, um, very significant, troubled family and personal relationships, difficulty expressing emotions and feelings. This is very, very typical. History of being teased or, or bullied and history of physical or sexual abuse, abuse clearly. Uh, maybe the interpersonal factors here. Um, and I would say that um, having worked very closely with a colleague um, at the Maudsley over many years um, and some of the research that was undertaken there really did highlight the fact that for many girls in particular there were significant difficulties with their mother and the relationship that they had with their mother very sadly. So I think there is also um, a very significant element of an inability to express emotion and to be honest and open and communicate feelings. And obviously the social factors, which we've already touched on, the cultural pressures to glor that glorify thinness, narrow definitions of beauty and cultural norms that value people on the basis of their, of their physical appearance and not on their character, their inequalities, their strengths, their talents. So 
so what do we need to look out for um, in terms of the anorexic child or young person? This is the individual who will be skipping meals, only take tiny portions, won't eat food in front of other people. They'll be quite ritualistic about it. And they may chew mouthfuls of food, but spit them out before swallowing and, and, and put them in a pocket or under the table, etc. Um, and, you know, adults here, well, they'll, they'll cook for the, the entire household, but they won't eat any of the meals. They'll tend to just put them out and, and say, oh, I, I ate while I was cooking, etc. There'll always be an excuse not to eat. So the bulimic child or young person or adult will usually be the person who's gorging. This will be generally done in secret. So um, they'll buy special food for this very often. Um, and if they're panicked about any kind of weight gain, they may purge then to try and get rid of the, the calories. So a lot of um, binging, really significant binging, and then the guilt, the shame and the, the purging um, and the sickness and vomiting. Many of those children, young people or adults with um, anorexia in particular will be engaging in really excessive and compulsive um, activity. And the problem here is that um, they might consume um, sports drinks, etc., or supplements, but very often the total calorie intake is far less than they're expending in their, in their activities um, in the gym or, or outside wherever they, they, they're achieving this kind of really compulsive exercising. And very often what, what's interesting in terms of thinking, feeling, behaving patterns is that, you know, although many might be above average intelligence in terms of um, cognitive ability, they will tend to think in really kind of simplistic ways, um, which is, is quite difficult for some to com comprehend, really. If I'm thin, I'll feel better about myself. Um, so this lack of logic and lack of reasoning um, engenders really quite irrational um, belief sets um, and the denial of anything being wrong at all and this kind of need for perfection, which in turn um, results in a lack of concentration um, and also sort of envy around other people who they perceive to be thinner and more beautiful, etc. So they're seeking to emulate such individuals. And this inability, the lack of emotional literacy here, the inability to talk about or express their feelings, particularly when they're feeling angry and stressed and upset and anxious, um, there'll be a great sense of denial, which I think, again, engenders much more um, greater levels of stress and anxiety. They'll tend to become much more moody or withdraw socially and feel, feelings of inadequacy and, and fear are generally very, very common. And for some, the need of this kind of affirmation is, is really quite intense and they will tend to really try to be a people pleaser. And, and if this doesn't work for them, then they, they may withdraw and become socially isolated. They'll also try to gain some control about where and when other people in the family eat, if, if they are asked to eat with them, for example, and also try to dictate what should be on the menu if, if that's the way in which the family home works. For example, saying, I don't want to eat these particular place um, um, foods because they are too high in, in fat content or sugar content, or I don't want to go to that particular restaurant or food outlet because the food is high fat and calorific, etc. Um, and also socially as well. Um, individuals um, who've got these kinds of eating disorders, um, particularly with anorexics, um, they are so controlling that they, they really do tend to kind of make decisions that are quite rash and that can engender some um, very risky sexual behaviours, for example. But although, you know, the craving for true intimacy is there, at the same time, there's a, there's a general fear of this and a fear of any kind of form of social risk taking. So what can we do? Um, generally, this would be advice given to anyone who feels as if they have an eating disorder or are worried about any disordered patterns of eating or becoming anxious. But also we can use this kind of checklist to check in with kids that they are doing these things. So keeping a food diary, um, we would do this um, to, in order to really identify what the intake is and, and actually trying to get some level of honesty clearly around this um, and creating a simple menu plan um, and been doing this with someone who is professionally skilled and able to do it. So a nutritionist would obviously be um, asked to help out with this. So making sure that there is a really balanced, wholesome diet, weighing themselves weekly, not more often, actually having exercise that is a rational, rationally planned in and realistic. And again, health professional would support with this and any medication would need to be used appropriately obviously avoiding the kind of diets and reducing intake of 
kind of celebrity magazines, online images that would actually trigger or engender some of their more negative eating patterns. And not rushing food, so learning how to eat food mindfully and trying to eat more often, more frequently with families and friends who are trusted, who can be supportive. And just to also flag up here the ASD girl in eating disorders, because clearly for many of our ASD teen girls in particular, there is a clear link here for many of them with the diagnosis and um, additional mental health problems that they may have in conjunction with this so comorbidity and eating disorders. And I think my, my concern for a long time has been around um, the complexity of so and social context of social media for all our young people. But I think it's particularly stressful for girls and young women on the ASD continuum who don't necessarily have that skill set of analysing and accurately interpreting the content and behaviour of other users without really experiencing higher levels of stress. So, and I think that these can engender for many of them significant anxiety disorders, social phobia, self-harm and eating disorders. So we, we really do need to ensure that this group in particular, we are very, very um, engaged with and we engage in using watchful waiting and, and, and thinking, you know, very observant about their behaviours in the school context around food. Um, because I think that this does and can go um, missed in terms of the part of being part of the diagnosis as well. Well, um, a few years ago, I did some research in um, a couple of special schools um, looking at what girls with ASD were experiencing and what they wanted from school, but what their concerns were around their whole area of well-being, mental health. And they highlighted all these different areas as being significant when we did the thematic analysis of the research. These were the key themes that came out and safety online was one of them and risky sexualized behaviors and CSE risk. And this was generally because of the way in which they interpreted other people's behaviors online and were taken in in a way that perhaps girls who were not on this continuum possibly would not be. But this was also linked to clearly to their obsessions with particular boys or, or people in the media. But the eating disorders was something that came up as a significant concern and issue for many of them. As a result of this, um, myself and Dr. Amy Such have produced the ASD Girls Wellbeing Toolkit, which I am flagging up here um, unashamedly because I think it is, it's a now award-winning um, publication, but I also think that it does address these concerns. We developed an intervention um, that really did work through all of the um, key themes that we identified in the research. So it's a programme specifically designed to address the concerns and provide them with opportunities to develop the kind of skills they need within the context of a nurturing group in order to navigate all of these particular difficulties. And of course, eating disorders, self-harm are covered in this programme. So I would just want to flag that up for you. But at this point in the, in the presentation, maybe it's just um, something you want to just think about um, and it's a question I would pose if I was delivering this to you um, face to face. How many girls and young women with eating disorders do not have a diagnosis of ASD? Um, I wonder, I mean, we, we can't know for sure, but I would uh, warrant um, that there are some, there's probably significantly small but significant um, group out there that have eating disorders but also probably have ASD and have not been diagnosed due to the fact that they are female. How would that help? And interestingly, the research um, does give us some yeah, valuable insights here, I think. Researchers at the Maudsley have been studying the similarities between autism and anorexia, for example, and they found that both patients had a tendency to behave obsessively and suffer from these rigid ways of thinking. So you could see how ASD girls would be more at risk from developing eating disorders. Um, starvation intensifies autistic characteristics like rigidity and obsession, according to Janet Treasure at the Maudsley. So when underweight, those with anorexia seem to get even more like those with autism. So it can be really difficult for them to interpret other people's emotions. They can't regulate their own emotions and they might get overwhelmed, get this kind of real overwhelming sense of panic and fear um, when they're frightened or angry. So it's really interesting, I think. Um, also, according to this research, the underweight individuals with anorexia perform poorly on the classic test of understanding other people's emotions. So 
I think autism and anorexia are most connected through a hyperfocus on specific situations, items or thoughts and food related struggles. So when these are coupled together, this is the issue. It can be difficult to get a diagnosis and effectively manage the symptoms. So I think a lot more work needs to be done here clearly. Girls have um, traditionally not been diagnosed as early as boys. We know with, with, with ASD and we know that this is um, linked directly to, according to uh, Professor Francesca Happy, to their um, ability to mask ASD um, traits and behaviours. So I think this classically has led to this real level of stress and anxiety for them in, in the learning context in particular, but also around eating behaviours. So I think we need to actually um, ensure that the diagnosis processes are more tuned and attuned to girls. And I know that um, Francesca is doing a huge amount of work on this at the moment. Um, so hopefully this will be something that improves significantly in, in the not too distant future. Uh, I think in terms of intervention, we need to ensure that all our young people are taught emotional regulation, how to self-soothe, access to mindfulness, if that's appropriate for some ASD children and young people, it's not. Um, it can engender um, kind of repeat patterns of um, experiences of PTSD, for example, and, and re-trigger things. Um, but grounding, visualisation, using motivational interviewing, CBT techniques, desensitisation and developing anxiety hierarchies and ways of managing this in a stepped approach can be really helpful for all our children and young people with or without eating disorders, actually. So if we're worried about friends, if we're worried about colleagues um, or children who we think have issues in this area, we need to set time aside to really talk. Private, respectful time. Um, when we're going to be really honest, we show that we really do feel and care for that individual. And, um, you know, it's something that, you know, ensuring that there are no distractions is essential um, because that actually implies to that young person that we really do care for them and respect them. And communicating our, our concerns, you know, we, we're curious about what's going on for them, but we think there may be a problem. So we need to actually ensure they get the professional help they need. So encouraging them, but not demanding that they seek additional support and offering to go with them to the counsellor, the GP, whoever. Um, and avoiding this kind of conflict is exactly the same with self-harm. You can't force someone or demand that someone stops engaging in these behaviours. We have to be very clear about this. We are concerned. This is how we feel about it. And we don't we don't want to actually um, dictate to them what they have to do, but we want to be there to support them and nurture them and help them. And we're available as a supportive listener to them is the message that they need to hear, in my view. And again, avoiding placing shame or guilt on them is really, really important. We don't want accusatory um, statements like you just need to eat, you're just acting responsibility, you're just sel selfish or attention seeking, etc. I think it's really, really important that this is totally avoided. Also, we can't give simple solutions. You know, if, if you just stop, everything would be fine. They can't just stop. Um, it's the same with any form of self-harm. Um, if people could do that, then they would probably because no one wants to actually really do this. But actually, it's addictive behaviour and it's a pattern of behaviour and it's much, much more complex than that. Um, expressing our continued support, as I said previously, is vital. And alongside this, um, skills training and therapeutic techniques for anxiety would also clearly form part of any um, approach to supporting children with eating disorders. Um, in my um, second session of this CPD series, I, fo I focused on anxiety. So you'll find uh, far more information about each one of these different areas, these skills training and therapeutic techniques in that particular presentation. So I won't go into too much detail here, but just to say all of these are explained fully in um, session number two of this CPD Coffee Time series. And clearly also um, alongside uh, the therapeutic interventions and approaches, uh, we would also be ensuring that children, young people, all of them have access to a positive psychology wellbeing curriculum. And the positive psychology elements around expressing gratitude daily, journaling, volunteering, saving happy memories, um, three kind acts every day, remembering three good things at the end of the day, rituals that are positive, positive relationships, etc. All of this stuff should form part of any kind of therapeutic well-being toolbox for 
all our children and young people. So just thinking about this at this point, what would you do? What would you include? What do you include in your own wellbeing toolkit? And how could you see um, some of these elements being included for the children and young people with eating disorders that we currently support in our school contexts? So identifying what is healthy is absolutely vital. Challenging thoughts around, is this image real? What is the perfect image? Um, building positive relationships, so spending time with friends, people that love you and nurture you and support you and understand you. Regular exercise that is healthy and moderate and eating a balanced diet, obviously, and you can refer to the Eat Well guide for this. And resources to build this wellbeing toolbox for all our children and young people. These are just a few examples from my work. And I would just say that the building positive thinking habits, um, so increasing self-confidence confidence and resilience in young people through CBT for Hinton House is probably the key one that I would suggest would be useful in this particular area. And the essential read obviously here is the essential guide to cognitive behaviour therapy, because obviously this is something that all our children benefit from, as do we, in terms of being able to identify and, and intercept these negative thoughts. So breaking that OCD cycle for the children with BDD, for example. So um, we can all use these tools. We do not have to be therapists. We can use therapeutic tools in our everyday interactions with our children and young people. And this is healthy, ultimately, if we want to actually ensure that they maintain their well-being overall. So if you need additional um, information, support or CPD in this area, please have a look at the Wellbeing Toolkit for Mental Health Leads. There's a very comprehensive um, section in here, one of the modules on body image eating disorders. There's also clearly a range of um, modules on specific therapeutic interventions around anxiety like CBT mindfulness. So I think this will be really, really helpful for you to look at. And of course, in a time when schools are financially constrained, it's extremely cost effective. So thanks for listening um, to my ramblings. Um, I do tend to just talk to the slides and, and, and um, hopefully um, it makes sense. And hopefully there is something that you can take away from this. There may be lots of things that you want to investigate further as a direct result of listening to this CPD session today and that's great so um, just thinking about how it might impact on your practice how any of the information that you've gleaned from this particular CPD session might make a difference to the way in which you interact with children and young people or simply um, increase your levels um, your observational levels in terms of looking at out for signals and signs that children may be experiencing some level of eating disorder or body image problems so I hope it was helpful. So thank you very much again and um, look forward to you hopefully participating in my next session in this series. So I'm, I'm aiming to do quite a few more of these and hopefully they'll be useful for practitioners working in schools or in other nurturing environments in terms of supporting children's well-being. That's the aim. That's what I'm trying to do here. So thanks again for listening.